welcome friends to this uh, afternoon session of our monthly meeting i'm very happy to see all of you again there is a saint there was a saint his name was bhikkhu and he made a wonderful statement he said i'll quote him and then i'll translate for you bhikkhu baat agam ki kehan sunan mein nahi jo jaane so kahe na जो कहे सो जाने ना ही ट्रांसलेटेड इट मीन्स ओ बीकू द नॉलेज अबाउट दैट हायर लेट्स कैन नॉट बी स्पोकन वन हु नोज नेवर स्पीक्स एंड वन हु स्पीक्स डज नॉट नो सो नाउ यू नो वेयर आई स्टैंड आई स्पीक ऑल द टाइम आई हैव स्पेंट माय होल लाइफ स्पीकिंग टू सच एन एक्सटेंट that my mother in law told me he said your secret has been that you make your living by speaking and she was right i served in so many jobs i never worked just spoke i got so used to speaking i've never used any paper or notes to speak have you ever seen me holding a paper to speak to you i never used them today i have a paper so going to be an exception to the rule i was once a vice chancellor of a university and after i retired they invited me back to speak at their commencement address convocation address what they call it in india and they said you have to send us the script of your talk in advance because we always print it and we distributed it while you were talking so we needed it in advance i said i'm very busy no time to do that will it be all right if i bring the script with me and read it at that time they said then we'll have arrangement in the auditorium itself a translation from your speech printing from your speech taking place and we will immediately print it after your speech and distribute it we don't normally don't do that but we'll do it in your case you we'll record your speech from the recording we can make it so i went there carrying a regular file papers and i delivered my speech which is two or three pages long so i turned the pages as i spoke at the end i gave them my speech three black papers <laughs> so i remember it. so i'm not used to speaking from papers i get confused in the morning session i was distinguishing between mental achievements in meditation and spiritual achievements in meditation when you are having a mental realization you your mind feels happy it has broadens its knowledge broadens its awareness broadens its memory when you have spiritual experience love and devotion flows in you in a big way difference is there mental meditation is put your attention inside repeats the words of the mantra of the simran concentrate your attention and see when you can rise above this consciousness and go to another one spiritual meditation means close your eyes think of your beloved the master talk to him have imaginary conversation have imaginary tea or coffee with him spend time dance fly together in imagination the spiritual meditation they can both go at the same time also because we are so much governed by our own mind that the mind will step in so satisfy the mind with mental meditation satisfy the soul by looking at in imaginatively the beloved now when we imagine the face of our master which of course has been defined a third part of regular meditation the three part defined are in sutra of the yoga they defined are first repetition of words to control the mind and bring your attention there second listening to the inner sound so that you again are pulled inside and third is dhyan 
the contemplation of the face of your master. All three are supposed to be three steps and can be used together or separately. But the dhyan part is the one which is really connected with the spiritual feeling that when you are drawn by the master and you can have an imaginary conversation with the master, there are two types of imaginary conversations. One is pure imagination that you are thinking who the master is and who is I'm talking to him. Second is connected with the real human being who you have considered a master. When you do the second part, that's what brings you to the spiritual progress. Second part means that you remember the actual conversation, the actual time when you saw the master. It's a recall. It doesn't start with the imagination. It starts with memory. You recall when you saw the master. What did he say? How was he talking? How was he walking? What was he doing? You recall the memory. And then when you recall the memory and the picture of that old event comes back to you, something strange happens. If the master said one sentence to you at that time, you imagine that, the master say the second sentence when you're imagining it. It becomes so real over time and you don't realize what you are watching is actually what will manifest and is called the radiant form of the master. People are writing to me hundreds of letters. We want to reach the radiant form of the master ASAP. It's not ASAP. I reply ASAP in a Brahmanical time which is a million years. <laughs> In Brahma's time, one million years is called ASAP. What are, the point I'm making is that the starting point of the radiant form is the recall of our experience with the physical form. We have no other form known to us. We start with the physical form of the master, which we have seen. And we don't just recall, make up the face of the physical form. We recall an actual meeting, which brings to our notice a very important factor, if you have never seen your master, you can't have proper dhyan. So third part is missing. Some people say we never saw a master, we are initiated by a master. What did great master say when an American disciple of his asked him, Master, is it necessary to have your darshan to see you? And how often should we come and see you? He said, without darshan you can't have dhyan. Dhyan comes from having an actual darshan. Actual. And unless you can have that experience, how can you then remember anything? Even making it up. And making it up, mind can start making up in many directions and can be a negative entity and a negative power can come in and pretend to be the master. When you remember the master who you met, you, then mind can't make it up. It's a memory. Recall. And therefore, in order for the mind not to go away from this experience of Hidarshan, you should have it as often as possible. He said, Master, what's the minimum one should do? He said, the best is if you can have Hidarshan once a day. Physical Hidarshan, physical person. He said, Master, what about people who are living far away, can't afford to come, can't come? He said, once a week should be all right. When this conversation was taking place, not only I was there, my dad was there, my grandfather was present. And my grandfather took that hint. From that day onwards, he went to see great master every week without fail, just because of this statement. And then the American disciple said, Master, some people are living very far. They can't afford to come even a week. He said, in that case, once a month should be all right. People are living far. They have to afford to come. Once a month is good. Then the disciple said, what about people living overseas like myself? I live in the United States. How often can I come to see you? He says, for such people, once a year is good enough. He said, Master, what about people who cannot come once a year? The great master smiled. He said, they can wait for the next life. <laughs> this, this thing is not going, going away. You can come and meet again next life. Showing the importance. Why is it so important to see the physical form of a master? Just because without that, the dhyan cannot be practiced. If you see twice, dhyan becomes easier.
you see five times dhyan becomes even more easy that is why there is such a important relationship we create with a physical human being and what do we find when we withdraw attention and go to the astral plane the master is there especially if you are going with dhyan he is there even while you are going there because you are constantly thinking of him and imagining him the imagination becomes reality because he proceeds from what you are remembering to more than what you are remembering and that's how the radiant form is radiant why is it called radiant form is the lights shining out of the master or what i see some people have drawn picture that master light coming out from all the way down i said what is that that's the radiant form of the master naturally if something radiant light has to come like this i said uh, what do what do you look like in the astral plane plane i look like just like i am as the radiant i said no you are as radiant as the master radiant the word has been used because in that state of being we don't need outside light to see anything in the physical world in this physical level of experience unless light falls upon us we can't be seen in darkness we can't be seen in the astral region you can see without light falling on something therefore there is some light inside everything and that shows up example is clear you can close your eyes in complete darkness cover them with black blankets and imagine you are seeing something you see it what lights show you that how can imagination show you something in total darkness because when you will see something in total darkness nothing no light is falling upon it to show you the objects and persons and beings in that state have their own light and that shows up and that's how we can see them we can't see them in pure light form which comes later but in that light form you can see them and therefore because we see the master in that in darkness we can see him completely therefore we call it the radiant form of the master it does not mean he is somebody else some people tell told master master is happy to see you i want to see the radiant form also he says who is that guy <laughs> maybe you are looking for somebody else it's the same person is the same being so that is why uh, don't take it that this is going to be a very difficult experience when you will see the radiant form you start recalling the master bring it up in your mind talk to the master inside radiant form will appear right there even in total darkness you can talk and do that so that is why we sometimes have exaggerated some of these things to the point that we think it's not accessible they're very easily accessible and when love draws us and that's the secret key when we meet a perfect living master who is going to be our perfect living master for whom we are like a mock sheep as a shepherd has come to take us when that happens the pull is automatic something happens to us that we are being pulled by something sometimes we don't feel it immediately sometimes we feel it immediately the very first time sometimes there is some kind of interest in that person interest in what he is saying but the pull comes little later but the pull has to come if that relationship of a disciple and a perfect living master is to exist people ask me questions how can we know who is our master <coughs> there are so many masters the great master used to say at that time in india he said probably there are more masters than disciples now the number of masters grown so much many of them do it as a business making money many of them do it to just get wealth fame something some desires of their being fulfilled by becoming masters perfect living masters have never come like that they don't say they are masters they don't claim anything they claim they are merely disciples doing seva doing service to their masters they never claim their master they never try to show off anything of their mastery to them they do show no public miracles standing in the streets but they show private miracles to every one of their disciples so there's a very big difference so those masters when they come into our life 
that all comes, it's a very, very good time to follow such a person. If no pull, keep on seeking inside. One day, master will come in response to your seeking and pull you. So when people ask me, who's our master? I said, whoever pulls you. So it's an easy definition. Uh, master, one guy wrote to me, two masters pulled me equally. Now what shall I do? I said, very lucky we can't find one. You found two. Follow any one of them. The other point about masters is that we do not always run into a perfect living master the first time we are seeking. Our seeking is not just starting in a little while now and gone. It's been for several lifetimes. The seeking does not arise and complete in one lifetime. It takes over a lifetime. During those different lifetimes, we come across many teachers, many masters, who take us up to a certain point to bring our seeking up to date. It's only when we are ready at the last moment to go beyond the mind into pure spirituality, a perfect living master appears in our life. We don't find him. He appears. This is very important. When we find masters, we can find many masters. When we are ready for the perfect living master, he appears by coincidence, by circumstances. When he appears, it takes us sometimes time, depending upon our mind, to recognize him. Sometimes it takes a long time. doesn't matter. In terms of the several lifetimes we have been seeking or staying in this wheel of reincarnation, very short time. One lifetime is very short time. So one should never bother that it's taken me so many years to do this. It took me so many years. One of the American disciples of this master, his name was Julian Johnson, Dr. Julian Johnson, wrote those books, Path of the Master, with the Great Master, and so on. So he came to at a very advanced age. And once he was going to say, Master, I came so late to you, Master stopped him. He said, no, you, nobody comes late. You come in time. Nobody comes late. No matter what your age, this is the age of your body. This is not the age of the seeker. The seeker happens to be sitting in this body at this time. You can't say your seeking is based upon the body. Seeking is taking place inside. Seeking is always by the soul, not even by the mind. Mind seeks other things. Mind seeks mostly external things. Internal things are intellectual property, intellectual gains. But never this true spiritual home of ours. Where do I belong? Who am I? Where did I come from? The basic questions of the soul, mind cannot answer. Mind never seeks. But the soul seeks. A soul that seeks is waiting to be loved by pure love. And the devotion comes automatically with that. So that is why one should never worry which master have. Have the master right for you at that time. He'll take you to the point where he can take you. And then you will feel you need more. You haven't got what you wanted, what the seeker was wanting. Automatically, another master comes. There can be several masters in the few lifetimes in which we are seeker near. It's only when we are ready to go beyond the mind. And our desire is to go to our real true home where a perfect living master comes into our life. Automatically. He does a simple thing. He says, I accept you, my friend. Simple words. What are the meaning of these words? I accept you, my friend. This means, now you are my friend. A man is speaking, who is speaking from our true home. Not that he has been to the true home. Some people have this mistaken notion that perfect living master are those who went to such Khand and came back for us. That is not a perfect master. That is not the definition of perfect living master. Perfect living master is one who is aware and conscious while here with us in a human body, conscious of every level of awareness, including our true home. When such a person says, I accept you, my friend, he will become a friend from true home. It's a guarantee that he will take you to your true home. 100% guarantee. We call it initiation. Just give another word. Initiation. 
initiation by a perfect living master only means that he has said, I'll take you back home. Do you know if he didn't have a mind, if he didn't have doubts, if he didn't have fear, we would say a journey has ended. We found a friend who's talking from the true home, has come from true home, and said, I'll take you. What else is needed? What else do we need? But mind's questions. Mind is losing its ground. I want to fight. And therefore create doubt. Sometimes fear. Maybe he's not a divine being. He's Satan. It could be the devil trying to mislead me. The mind talks in such strange language. And then we say, oh, how do we get over it? Same friend who smiles at us because he knows he's going to take us home. Says, meditate. More meditation. You need a lot more meditation. Follow these ads. Follow these restrictions. Make it a real struggle. And we follow his method. Mind says, okay, it's very hard. It's so hard to try. He can't meditate even what he wants us to meditate. He says, meditate one-tenth of your time. Just a formula taken from the old tithes used to be one-tenth of your net income, give it to charity. Okay, one-tenth of your time, give to spirituality. Say two and a half hours out of every 24 hours. So, all right, I'll meditate two and a half hours. And we meditate, meditate, must be two hours now. Ten minutes? <laughs> What's going on? Why did it become so difficult? I was sitting with my friend yesterday, you are chatting away. And we were saying we'll only chat for half an hour. Three hours passed and we didn't know. And now here we try to meditate. Two and a half hours and ten minutes have only passed. Mind is fighting. Mind is preventing us. That is why so much is required by way of mental meditation, mental struggle, mental this thing because of our mind. That is why when I spoke in the morning, we have to go through mental meditation for the sake of something that has been sitting with us which we have not used properly, which are supposed to be serving us, we have been serving it and become its slave and now we have to get out of it, so mental meditation is necessary. It will become necessary because of our condition. After that, we discover the mind can give us nothing, struggle can give us nothing, effort can give us nothing. And then we realize there is something else that gives us. And then we go to the spiritual side, the love and devotion. So that is why it, the love and devotion as we know it, the physical plane is between two persons. The love that we experience that pulls us is with a person, a human being. Somebody can say, I love my dog. My dog is like a human being. I hear people say about their pets. I love my cat. I've never seen anybody loving a pet, forgetting the I, and only talking of the pet. Everyone says, I love my pet. When they love a human being, the I is forgotten. Beloved is taking its place. There's a difference. The difference, a human being is different. We can love God in the abstract. I love God. But you can't say that when it comes to human being. Pure love will not be able to say, I love this. A big difference. When a perfect living master comes into our lives and pulls us with his pure, unconditional love, it affects us differently because it's not affecting the mind, it's affecting the soul, it's touching our soul. And that is why we feel pulled by it and without knowing why. The mind can't even understand sometimes why it's happening. I gave the example the other day to some friends of mine. There was an intellectual professor who disputed all that the great master used to teach. He said, this is all man-made. There is no divinity in it. There is nothing divine. The religion is also just made up for people to just have something to lean on. It's just an escape from the suffering of this world. And spirituality is also another kind of religion, new religion. These are all new religions as an escape from our problems of this world. So he would come and discuss with great master. Master, I don't believe anything that you say. You talk very forcefully, but that doesn't mean that it becomes true just by your forceful talk. 
Because I can tell you this, anybody can make up the stories that you're making. There may be no such current, maybe no true home, there's nothing. And just big stories have been made up, like you, Master. And then you come and teach people, do this, do this. I don't think I'm interested in any of this. Great Master said, Professor, you have a right to think the way you like. I have the right to believe what has my experience. My experience happened to be a little different from yours. So we have the right, each of us, to have our own opinion. And I respect your opinion because that is your experience. Thank you. Man went away. Next week he was back to tell the master the same thing all over again. He said, Master, I don't believe anything that you say. Master said, yes, you told me last week also. And I agree that uh, that's your experience, that this is not a believable thing. It's just made up, man-made. Somebody has designed a great big picture of spirituality, and we people are trying to use it to make it real. Maybe it's not real. Maybe you are right. Third week, he's again there on that weekend. He said, Master, what you teach is not right. He said, but I want to ask you, you told me the same thing two weeks. Why are you come again? He said, I don't know why. I like to come. <laughs> How do you explain this? The mind is trying to say no. And something is saying yes. Of course, he became a very good disciple of Great Master. Very good disciple. And got good experiences. Great Master used to say, giving me that example of that man, that if you are an intellectual with a lot of doubts, and you clear your doubts, and then you may faster move than those who only move on, the, on faith. Pure faith can lead to a breakdown of faith if something bad happens in this life. Because we collect all the information about Master's work from what is happening in our life. Good things are happening, Master. All your kindness, all your grace. You can see your grace. Bad thing has happened, Master. How could that be? You, can you be a Master if you did this to us? Faith is gone. On the other hand, when you assimilate the information, the limitation of the mind through intellect, and you discover the limitation of your own mind, own intellect, and then move forward, that faith is far more firm and stable. So you used to say there's an advantage in both situations. Anyway, I'm just sharing this information to you because don't take it one method or the second method as preferable or not. They come into our life as we need them. When we are trained by the mind to use it for all decision making, we have to meditate hard and get over it. Sometimes people say, why do you tell people to meditate? Honest answer, so that you find out meditation gives you nothing. <laughs> Honest answer. If you're a spiritual seeker and you're meditating with your mind, you yourself find out the limitation. But if you don't try, you don't believe it. Our mind does not believe. I didn't have the experience. Certainly. People tell me. That man says he was able to fly in the sky and see these things. I don't believe him. I don't think this happened. Why don't you believe him? Because I didn't see it. See how much we are basing on universal knowledge and belief based on our own knowledge. We don't have it. Nobody has it. And that's what a very open way of looking at knowledge. Somebody else can have more experience, more knowledge than you. We can say, I don't have it. I will not take it on blind faith because somebody else has it. It doesn't mean somebody else cannot also have it. But we are constantly judging the limits of knowledge from what we have and applying it to everybody who is around us. So that's not an openness. Openness is somebody has, maybe you can also have. But you have to try for it or you would experience it in some other way. The secret of getting the highest spiritual knowledge is to seek for it. Seek insight. No argument. No questioning. Seeking. If you seek, perfectly way master will appear in your life. Seeking has not to be shouting anywhere inside yourself. Seek insight. Simple question, basic question, who am I? Who am I really? If I am not this body, who is in this body? Where do I belong? Why am I here? 
What made me get trapped into this dog karma here? What has made me get into all this? What's the secret behind it? What's the mystery behind it? Questions like these, I want to get the answer. Give me the answer inside. That's the seeking. Inner seeking. You will see master come outside. He will come inside. You won't recognize. You won't see. When he comes outside, recognize because you are living outside in a physical body. When you meet the master outside, what does he say? He says, go inside. He doesn't say find answer outside. Go inside. As you go inside, what do you find? Master is inside. Why did he appear outside? Because we never went to see him inside. When he's outside, he tells us go inside. We go inside, we find him. Same master. Not same master. Real master. Outside will die. This one doesn't. Real master. Who has the same length of existence as we have. And supposing we really are lucky enough to reach our true home. What will we find in the true home? That the self which we thought was separated from all selves. The self which was separated from the master was the same as the master. It is our own self that appears as master in this level. But this realization only comes when we reach our true home. That the self is a secret. That the self which we are right now feeling, the self is enclosed in a simple separate human body. There's so many millions and trillions of beings outside in different form. All separated are actually all one. The separation ends at the true home, not earlier. Earlier we say, oh, we are all one, but I hate you, you know. I don't like that one. We are all one, but we like, don't like that one. This is a mental game we play. The spiritual truth that the origin is only one totality of consciousness. There is only one source from where all experience is originating including the experience of the many, the experience of having many. This is generated from one source, and that source is our true self. It's very, very difficult to uh, even imagine it, because imagination is also controlled by the limits of the mind. And that is why ordinary imagination cannot take us to that level. But experience and being pulled beyond the mind can take us. And truthfully, sitting here, I can say this can only be done with a perfect living master in our life. People say, if the truth is within ourselves, truth is ourself, why do we need intervention of a third party outside? Such a questioner is questioning his first statement. The person who says truth is inside us, if he knows that, he will know the master is inside us, not a third party. He doesn't know the truth when he says the truth is inside. He's telling us, believing everything outside is real and truth is inside. How can everything out be outside? When everything outside becomes inside, then you know the truth. That everything outside is coming from the same source. So that is why at this stage of our life when we are sitting in human bodies, we need the guidance of the self, ultimate self, expressed as an other human being like ourselves, whom we can talk to, share with, share our seeking with, and whose love we can experience. So that is why it's so important for the highest level of experience of our own self. And by the way, <clears throat> I want to ask your forgiveness for using the word experience. You cannot have an experience of anything beyond the mind. The very language which we use, experience, is all experience we are thinking of is in time. And we tell stories. When you will go to your true home, what will you see? I don't know if you'll have these eyes to see or what kind of experience you will have, but it won't be experience. You lose what is called experience even in Par Brahm just as you cross the mind. It's a state of awareness. The state of awareness doesn't become an experience. Experience is a happening, and happening takes time. 
and therefore it takes time in, in mind. We're talking of states of being, which is a true state, but this can be discovered while you're still here in a human body. That's the most wonderful thing. It's available right here. So that is why seek and you will find. What will you find? Find a friend who is speaking from there, is there while he's talking to you and has said, I'll take you back, period. Then follow his instructions just to cover the ground for our own mind. That is why there's a stage that you go with the mind, that you go with the soul, that you go with totality and you find everything was only one which was being experienced by us at all levels without break as the self. Imagine the self, what we're considering now our self, that never breaks. You can have a dream and have a totally different form in a dream, you still know it's yourself. You can go to a higher level and it become formless or a, just a piece of light flowing, you still know it's the same self. The identification of the self is never lost. But that's the only reality. Everything is created around it. I forget the time nowadays. I got a Apple Watch. <laughs> reminds me of Adam and Eve always. <laughs> and the re reason being, if it was a complete apple, I would think of the fruit. It's already bitten. And we are suffering because of that. We are all looking for spiritual path thanks to the biting of the apple by Eve with Adam. So that is why they made this watch. You look at the apple, it's already bitten up. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining me today. And I'll, uh, I thought I'd take some questions maybe next time.